Sunday morning towards the end of summer. What a beautiful day the Lord has given us to worship and to praise his name. Uh, we want you to come to a time of worship this morning. So would you stand together? The, uh, the song that we're going to sing is, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. Have you ever thought about the words of, of, uh, of that, uh, the word of that song? It says, one day every knee will bow and one day every tongue will proclaim that Jesus is Lord. But the greatest, the greatest privilege is to those who gladly choose you now. That's something to be said. We are able to do that this morning. Come, now is the time to worship. about you but I look forward to Sundays and being in this place of worship um, hearing the music and seeing the people and it just blesses my heart um, if you have not already uh, there are slips um, tablets at the end of your pew um, if you would sign those and pass those down and as you do pass them down if you don't know the person sitting next to you greet them and um, that would be great also, um, if you are new or visiting, we want to hear from you, and there are slips in the front of the pews that you can fill out. 
Um, but also, if you don't have a church home and you're wanting to find a place to be connected, we have lots going on here at Faith Memorial for all different ages. And I'm going to touch on some of those. But first of all, um, on Sunday, there's um, all different study groups, uh, not to mention Sunday school in the morning, but Sunday groups in the evening. And so those are listed in our bulletin. The first big announcement is for today. Um, a back to school gathering. That's tough to say. Anyways, um, summer is quickly slipping by, but that's all right. And so today, the Faith Connections, which is if you're in your 30s, 40s, um, we have a group called Faith Connections, and they are planning, or they have planned a before back to school gathering today at 1230. And that says to come and hang out with your family and friends. Um, and they're meeting at Chestnut Ridge today at 1230, so right after church, not long. It said bring lunch for your family and some lawn chairs, and kids can bring fishing poles to fish in the pond. So if you're looking for something to do this afternoon and you're in that age group, um, and whether you have kids or not, uh, that would be a fun thing to do. Another way to get connected in our church is Operation Christmas Child is, is big in our church, thanks to Michelle Williams, and now she has quite a bit of a following um, helping her with that. And So this Tuesday at 1 o'clock, um, Gladys Lawrence um, and others will be... Next Tuesday. Okay. So next Tuesday, um, that... So I have to say something. If you look at the Faith Connections 30 to 40, it says today at 1230, but then you read down, it says next Sunday. And Pastor Jonathan and I were discussing that, and he said somebody would correct me if I was wrong. I didn't expect to be corrected on this one, but here we go. So next Tuesday at 1 o'clock, meet with Gladys Lawrence and friends in the basement to work on projects for shoebox gifts. And um, if you have not ever been a part of that, um, and you want to be blessed, be a part of that. Even if you can only come one time or two times, that is an amazing ministry. And to know that those shoeboxes are going somewhere else in this world um, to bless a child um, who may not have ever heard about Jesus, who may not know the name Jesus, and um, you may never know who your box touched until the other side of this world. So, anyways, so, and then, okay, is it this Tuesday or next Tuesday that we're packaging? Do we know? This Tuesday, we are actually then meeting in Benner Fellowship Hall to prepare school pouches for shoebox gifts. So this Tuesday, if you want to help out at six o'clock, uh, we'll be meeting in Benner Hall to um, prepare school pouches for those shoebox gifts. So this Tuesday and next Tuesday, if you want to be a part of Operation Christmas Child, um, come join us. And then the last thing that I wanted to bring up is um, Reverend Sturm, Reverend Harold Sturm, has been a major part of this congregation for quite a few years, and in previous years to um, another congregation in, uh, in Lancaster, and he is so loved. He now is residing in Landings of Lancaster, which is right behind Pier 1 Imports. Um, he's there Monday, and Monday through Thursday would love, love, love to have visitors, and especially phone calls. And, and that would be recommended first to call and see if he's up for visitation um, anytime between the hours of 5.30 and 8. And his phone number is right there listed. And so he would love to meet with people from our church. So if you um, have some time, that would be great, and he would very much appreciate that. Okay, I think that's all. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, I consider it a privilege to be in your house today with like-minded people um, all coming together for one purpose, and that is to worship you and to grow our hearts with the knowledge of you. I pray, Lord, for Pastor Jonathan that as he brings his word, your word to us today, that you would bless him, that you would anoint him, and allow him to speak the words that we need to hear. 
Lord, I thank you for this summer and, and the adventures and the fun that it's brought. I thank you for the blessings that you've given to each person in this congregation. But as summer comes uh, nearing to an end and we're headed back to school, Lord, I pray for the children and the administrators and the teachers as they head back some this week, some next week. And I pray, Lord, that you would um, go with them, that you would prepare the way. For the kids, I pray that you would put like-minded people in their paths. For the teachers, I pray, Lord, that you would help them to let their light shine for you, even maybe if they're in a place where they can't openly discuss you. Lord, I pray for this church. I pray for the pastors of this church. And I ask, Father, that you bless each one in a way that they need to be blessed. I pray for their families. I thank you, Lord, for today in this service. And Father, may you be glorified in all things and be pleased as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I was reading this morning in, in my devotional time a little bit about Joshua and how as he came into leadership of the, the children of Israel, his prayer was, would you be like, would you be with me just like you were with Moses? And, uh, you know, we have the privilege of having that same great God be with us and close to us through all of the activities of our life. We've been singing a little song that talks about God of heaven's ain armies. And we're going to sing that again this morning. You're getting used to it. It has a great truth that that God, the great God is right beside us in the life we live day by day. Would you stand together as we sing? You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? God of angel armies is always by my side. Jesus, the cornerstone, the one we put our trust and our faith in, he is the one 
who stands beside us. Sing it now. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase. Ushers, would you come forward, please? When he shall come with trumpet sound, may I then in him be found. And that is, that is what we desire this morning, isn't it? That we will finish well. Amen. In just a moment, uh, Gianna Urban is going to do our offertory this morning. You might have noticed that uh, Mike has gotten a little shorter this morning. Uh, Mike and Kitty are out of town, and we're thankful that one of our young people is able to help us on the keyboard this morning, aren't we? Good. Okay. Let's pray together. Lord, you're our God. You're the one that stands by us. We are so thankful this morning for all the blessings of life that you give. We thank you for these beautiful days when we are once again reminded that even in creation, you bless us and you encourage us. And Lord, we pray that uh, you would just help us this morning as we worship and as we continue to hear your word, we would open our hearts to you. 
bless us as we give. We pray that as we give, that we would uh, honor you with the gifts that we give. And may we do our best to please you as we live in this world around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Gianna. What a lovely, lovely rendition of a worldwide known song. Amazing Grace. Thank you so much for making such a wonderful 
sound and presentation of that wonderful song, that marvelous song today. Well, if you're wanting to connect today with the Connections group who will be connecting at a connection spot at 12.30, highly unlikely that you'll be out of here by 12.30. Just saying. <clears throat> so I trust that you're flexible with your connection and your connecting time. We're looking at the rest of the story from last week, and we're looking today at Psalm 51. Last week we considered one of the most staggering realities of what you will find of any biblical character whose life is ever used as a hallmark of redemption. We looked at the rapid descent of a king who knew God. And it is a story that, remember, we must not gloss over. It is an account that we must not treat with indifference so that we can just simply cut to the chase and bring the good news. It is a tragic, tragic account of the infiltration of sin in a great man's life and what resulted from that allowance, what resulted from that intrusion. And then what we look at today is thankfully, rejoicingly, how an individual who had been engaged in such horrific sin found his way back to God. We thank the Lord for that. We give God credit. We also, though, want to place in our memory bank again <clears throat> that as wonderful of a recovery as this is, the tragic issues that resulted, the impact that resulted, the fallout of David's actions are not reversed. Consequences remain. They linger. Indeed, the prophet Nathan says that's just going to be the case, and it was the case if you look at the concluding years of David's reign and David's life. The question could be asked, what does God do with a deceiver? What does God do with an adulterer? What does God do with a murderer? What does God do with a person who did all of those things? What does God do with a person like that? You might say today, well, I, <clears throat> I'm not an adulterer. I'm, I haven't killed anybody that I know of. Um, thankfully, I don't fall in that camp. Well, don't boast too much. Sin in its seedbed, sin in its actions, um, and its accountability factor for every human being bears its own tale of woe. So let's not compare ourselves with David. We're not supposed to make that comparison anyway, are we? We are not to say, well, I'm better than so-and-so. At least I didn't commit adultery and didn't kill anybody. We are not to compare ourselves with one another. We are to reckon ourselves before God. We are to give an account before God. We are to recognize who we are in the mirror of who Jesus wants us to be and calls us to be. So as we look at Psalm 51, I want us to note this is the cry, this is the prayer of desperation. This is the calling out to the God who has been knowable before of a desperate man who is in a predicament beyond any imagination, any imagined thought that he would have had that he would be at this point in his life. So with that in mind, let's look together at Psalm 51. I'm going to read the entire psalm. <clears throat> I'm not going to sing it as would have been the custom. I'd empty the place, so I'm not going to sing it. I ought to do that. We ought to do that sometime just to throw you a curve. We ought to sing the psalm. We'll do that to you. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Hmm. What a statement. Deliver me from, from blood guiltiness. He had blood on his hands. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in, a, in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. There are three themes that I want us to consider this morning, and you may note these because we will give, I think, explanation in addition to each of these themes. But there is no question that in this psalm, this is David's response to the prophet Nathan's indictment that woke David up to his own spiritual trouble. One of the factors of sin is that sin builds calluses. It doesn't build calluses necessarily on the hands, doesn't build calluses on the knees, it builds calluses on the heart. And with every sin that is committed, and usually the temptation of sin and its allure and its power is contained chiefly in its subtlety. Sin lures by degree. Uh, if, you are, if, if you are honoring God, if you are living for God, if you love God, I highly doubt if you have your devotional time in the morning, I highly doubt... I highly doubt, and I think with some certainty I can predict, that upon having your prayer time and your fellowship time with God and upon reading His Word and then driving down the street heading into your day and passing a bank, I doubt you will have a compelling, forceful temptation to go rob it. If you do, <laughs> we need to talk. Temptation does not come in such brash and conspicuous ways. Temptation comes slowly, subtly, by degrees that just begin to move us in steps of hardly able to measure deviations. So much so that after a period of time, it will, if we wake up and if we are alerted by the Holy Spirit and accept His indictment on us, we will come to the conclusion that, in essence, we are shocked by how far we have gone. We will look at the outcome and wonder, how did we get here? What happened 
that we are now in the mess we're in, that we are this far away from God. And with, with great certainty today, I state that I believe David, when he was indicted by Nathan's story and that statement, you're the man, I believe that David came to a sense of horror and shock as he began by the power of the Holy Spirit to retrace his steps wondering how did I get to the point that I not only took another man's wife, tried to conceal it by all different kinds of plans, and ended up ordering his execution. How did I get here? And friends, the, the reality of sin is this. The devil has honed his craft with expertise. He's used it generation after generation. He's good at it. Now, it's the same thing. We ought to wake up to it. We ought to know his strategies. It's the same thing that he rolls out every time. But the reason that we are so blind to it is because generation upon generation upon generation has had this happen to them. We pay no attention usually to them. So we act as if we've newly arrived and we're the authors of all that is new and fresh and sophisticated and we ignore all of that stuff and Paul says we should not be ignorant of his devices. But we pay no attention to that. We don't read his word. So we go into a world unprepared to meet a predator like our enemy. And we think somehow smugly we can handle whatever he throws at us. That's a fool's errand. That's a fool's errand. I'm sure somewhere in that, David probably thought to himself, ah, this won't happen to me. Nothing will happen to me. That's one of the lies of starting to take step and action in line with the temptation that is offered. It won't undo me. I won't get caught. It will not wreck me. It will not, it will not wreck my home. It will not have fallout. There won't be innocent victims. On and on and on, the rationale goes that somehow this predictable step will not have impact on me. That is one of the deceptive factors of the temptation of our enemy. To bring us to the point where we will believe, I can take these steps of disobedience to God and it won't hurt me. And it will not hurt anyone else. Friends, I want to say it again. That's a fool's errand. A fool's errand. I can break vows. I can disobey God. I can move against his morals. I can dash his precepts. I can give no attention to his truth, but it will not be painful. That's a fool's errand. And here David is, king, chosen by God, anointed by Samuel, second king in Israel's history, first king, blew it royally. And David finds himself on the receiving end of the convicting and the indicting message of God's prophet. And I'm sure when he put on sackcloth and covered himself with ashes, and I'm sure when he got the word that the baby that has been conceived will die, I'm sure as all of that began to just come on to him, there was the awful realization, I didn't think this would happen to me. And I didn't believe that the harm that has been done could possibly have been done. I want us, as we look at what God is marvelous and gracious to do, I want us, though, nonetheless, to keep the balance and keep this tempered with the fact there's a dead man who won't come back to life. There's a woman, according to most scholars, most scholars indicate that in the Hebrew, there is great force and great authority put on Bathsheba. Some would say it was almost to the point of rape. So for those, for those pastors who have preached Bathsheba shouldn't, been, should have, shouldn't have been taking a bath on her patio or on a rooftop, don't pin this on Bathsheba because God doesn't. There's no account in Scripture of Nathan talking to Bathsheba. Huh? There's every account 
of Nathan talking to David. He took advantage. He's king, for goodness sake. He has unbridled authority. He answers ultimately to no one but God. But to God, he answers. So three things. This psalm is the mark of a, a desperate man praying a desperate prayer that has at least three components to it. A candid view of what is. A candid view of what is. A convicting view of what ought to be. And a compelling view of what can be. Those three factors are in this psalm. A candid view of what is, a convicting view of what ought to be, and a compelling view of what can be. But I want us to note this. It starts with what is. What is. The language that David uses in this prayer, this prayer of desperation, his language covers the scope of, of sin. I hope we'll get that. He uses at least three, maybe four different words in talking about what he's done, how he's behaved, and where it came from. The comprehensive nature of sin is covered in what David says in this psalm. He talks about the fact that there are iniquities, Sin, transgressions, uses these words for what reason? He is overwhelmed by the fact that sin has been powerful, profound, and active in his life in various forms and phases. He even goes on to say, that he was brought forth in iniquity. Now, there are versions, I don't, and you know, one of the versions I read often um, says that, you know, I, I was brought forth guilty. That is a horrible rendering of this text. He was not guilty when he was born. But he does talk about, and this is interesting what he, what he presents. I want us to get this because this is a man who's been awakened to the problem of sin. He's been awakened to the scope and the reach of sin. Get that when he uses all of these words. He said, I was brought forth in iniquity. This word means from a warm place. This was already going on. The warm place, that form of incubation is the womb. So what's he saying? He's saying that while he was in the, in the womb, as, as hard perhaps theologically to grasp all of this, in fact, in Sunday school this morning we were talking about the fact that if someone were to ask, how is sinfulness transferred from generation to generation? I don't know, but it is. I don't know, but it is. David says, while I was being formed in my mother's womb, iniquity was infiltrating my being, and I was being affected by this long, sad chronicle of what sin has done in the human condition since the fall. So that when I enter this world, I already have a tilt toward sin. We also talked in Sunday school class that is proven by every generation that ever goes to nursery school, goes to preschool, goes to Walmart. That is proven time and time again. I don't know how it gets transferred, but transferred it is indeed so. It is transferred. It gets transferred. I shared this with the class. Um, I love my granddaughter, Millie. There's no one cuter, better, sharper, special. But there's a reality about her that I know. 
what is a part of her because of the fall will show up. Sharma and I were in a little pool that we have on the patio for her. We were enjoying some time with her the other day and she wanted to play a game. So the game was, and we're not, again, not really sure of the game, not sure of the title, not sure of the rules because they seem to change, but we, we were involved in a game and the game was, um, come catch me, come catch me. And so she looked up at me and she said, Grandpa, you're in charge. I looked over at Sharma and said, there you go. <laughs> Chew on that for a moment. She said, you're in charge. And then it was, then it was, Grandpa, Grandma, you can't catch me. Come catch me. So we moved in to catch her. After all, we thought that's what she wanted. It evidently went against a rule of the game that was unspecified. And she immediately, I, I, it was, it was, it was inter interesting, immediately she just, she put out both arms, aimed at Sharma, aimed one at me, and she said, stop! And we, you know, it's crazy, we're the adults, we stopped. <laughs> she said, stop, we stopped. And she asserted at that point a new twist to the game. And the twist was, Grandpa's not in charge, Grandma's not in charge, but Millie, after she said stop, said, I'm in charge. <laughs> Millie hasn't had her third birthday yet. Now we laugh at that and it's kind of cute, but the, re the reality is that is a deep-rooted, deep-seated attitude with which we are born. And David says, I came into this world with this being formed in me in the warm place. Wow. I came into the world with this tendency, with this move. I came into the world this way. The comprehensive scope of sin is this. David is finally getting down to it. I had this condition in me that prompted me against even the precepts of God to say no to God, yes to me, and I then committed sins. I had a condition that urged me to push God away, and I had a tendency to pursue what I wanted instead. And I went from a condition to where it spawned action. Condition became actions. And those actions led to taking another man's wife, taking my authority in hand illicitly, pursuing a woman who was someone else's wife, and then to cover it up. I had her husband killed and after her mourning brought her in to the palace to be my wife. Do we get that? So David says, it's not just that I committed several unseemly acts, but he says, I've realized now something different. What is? What is? What is? I have a condition that was forming in me in the womb. What is? What is? Now, we might wrestle with the verse where he says that he's done this against God and God only, verse 4, and done this evil in your sight. But what David was saying was, I'm king. I answer to no one, but I answer to God. And it is in every regard as if I have done this specifically against God. He's not disregarding Bathsheba. He's not disregarding Uriah. He's not disregarding even the, what the palace people would know David had done. He's not disregarding the innocent lives of other soldiers. He's just saying this, I answer to God. We need to know that. We need to know that. We ultimately answer to God. And if we've done something against someone else, yes, that will require action. Yes, that will require different acts of penance, but we answer ultimately to God. He, he deals specifically with what is. And he says this as an honest, candid voice. I've done this, but this is what you want. I've done this, but this is what you demand. You desire truth in the inward parts. You desire truth in the innermost being. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. 
you want me in the deep recesses of who I am that maybe only you can see. You want truth. And David says this, I want to make this clear. God is fair in his judgment of me. God is honest with what he's saying about me. God's indictment of me is right. It's righteous. It's true. And it is what it ought to be. And he says, and he's basically saying, I want the world to know I'm not blaming God. I'm not skirting my responsibility. I'm not blaming Bathsheba. I'm not, I'm not saying I wish Uriah would have cooperated. He's saying, no, I did this. So God be justified in your judgment of me because I did this. A candid view of what is. A convicting view of what ought to be. God, you desire truth in the inward part. Friends, let's get a hold of the fact God desires truth holy rightness, truth, integrity on the inward part of us. This isn't just cleaning up the messes that we've made. This isn't just getting forgiveness for the sins we've committed. This is the fact that God desires to change the innermost part of us. And if we don't understand that, we are missing really the crux of the issue in the atonement. We are missing what God aimed to do by sending Christ in incarnate form. He came to do one thing. John sums it up. Destroy the works of the enemy. He came to undo what had been done in the fall. And it is not enough if all God can do in Christ is forgive us of our sins, He desires to change us in the innermost being where our flaw is greatest. David then, not only has a candid view of what is, a convicting view of what ought to be, but he has a compelling view of what can be. Look how things turn in verse 7. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. This is an allusion to, he, you know, he's alluding to this beautiful historical act that the people would have been familiar with, and it was this. When a leper came to the high priest saying, look at my skin, evaluate me, I believe I'm clean, the high priest would examine the individual who had been a leper, who had had to go through the city having called out before him, unclean, unclean, who had been separated from his family, all of those horrible realities of, of being leprous. He came to the priest. The priest examined him if his, if his skin was clean and he was, he was deemed no longer a contagious threat to culture. Boy, that's a picture of sin. A contagious, contagious threat to culture. Isn't sin a contagious threat to culture? Yeah, it is. If you went to the priest and he said you're clean, he would gather you in front of the people. This is a beautiful picture of redemption and restoration. And he would take a branch of hyssop, dip it in blood that had been shed, two turtle doves, and sprinkle it over him as a testament before the community. He's clean. He's clean. Accept him back, take him back, bring him in, restore fellowship, Return him to his family. He's clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. That is a picture of wash me over and over and over again until I am indeed spotless. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. I am under such conviction for what I have done. It is as if my bones are broken. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Whether the record is in some kind of writing, blot it over so it can't be read. If it's carved in stone, break the stone. If it's on slate, wipe out the slate. Wherever it's written, get rid of the account. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is a cry for something that David has never mentioned, at least in his life and his mentionings at this point. He's talking about a newness that he had not had to this point. This is a Genesis word. This is Genesis 1 word. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Blot out the record. Blot out the wrongs. That's forgiveness. That's pardon. 
That's restoration of an innocent account. But create in me. Remember he said, while I was being formed in the womb, sin entangled and enmeshed itself in a condition in me. I was born with it. It's followed me since birth. Followed me since the womb. But now he prays a prayer that is astounding. And you and I need to get it. He, pray, he prays one of the most desperate but radical prayers we could ever pray. Undo the record of the fall. Undo the impact of the fall in me. In essence, recreate, create something in me that has never been. And I want to say to us t today, that prayer was ignited by God to urge him to pray it. Why? Because God does not want us to stop short of what is essential for us to experience by the blood of Christ. He doesn't want us to say, oh, just forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, and I'll try harder, I'll do better, I'll, I'll, I'll be more faithful, I'll do this. David knew this, my heart betrayed me. My heart betrayed me. So the answer is not just cleaning up the mess. The answer is creating a different heart in me. I need a clean heart going forward because an unclean heart sponsored and urged these actions and responded to temptation as it did. Don't cast me away from your presence. And then he prays such a prayer. Don't, don't, please, Holy Spirit, don't leave me. Don't leave me. I'm done if you do. Don't leave me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. The outcome is wonderful. The outcome is beautiful. David's actions had not gone unnoticed by those closest to him. Sometimes we don't know the impact of what happens by those who have confidence in us and who watch us. Joab, the commander of his army, knew the whole sordid affair. Listen, junk travels quickly. You can just count on the fact that the whole palace was aware of the buzz, right? The jig was up. The news was out. This was known not only by David. This was known by a lot of other people. And their view of David had been dashed because he was the king they thought they could trust. Hmm? So what does David say? David says, I have work to do. If you do all of this, if I'm delivered from blood guiltiness, if I'm restored in your salvation, I will say things. I will speak things. I will teach things. I will also encourage through the life that you enable me to live, I will do good favor to those who are in Zion. I will build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices. What is David saying? The whole kingdom is blighted because of me. The whole kingdom has been affected by the fact that the guy who is chief in command has done this against God. Wow. He owned it. I think that's one of our greatest problems today is we don't, we don't own any indictment that is justified and fair. We excuse it away. We rationalize it away. We blame it on somebody else. You know, he, you know like David, Bathsheba, Bathsheba, Bathsheba. He wasn't, he wasn't blaming Bathsheba or anyone else. Personal pronouns in this psalm speak volumes. I have done it. I'm the man. My sins, my iniquities, my actions, my condition. We know this. 
God forgave. And I believe the God who, fought, who, who sponsored and who fostered that kind of a prayer in David also rewarded that prayer. I believe that. Thank God. I believe David's prayer that God ignited. God doesn't urge us to pray. God doesn't urge us to get desperate about our need and then just say, sorry, not today. No. If we search for him with all of our hearts, we're promised we will find him. Amen. We will find him. When we search for him with our whole heart, David was at that point. He searched for him with his whole heart. A desperate man and a desperate prayer leads ultimately to the wonderful outcome of God's gracious act to redeem by not only forgiving sins and blotting out the record, but also by cleansing, purging, purifying, one's heart so that the motive is no longer I want what I want when I want it it is no longer I am at the center of my life but God is central I love him supremely and I want to live for him fervently and I want to honor him daily and I want to walk with him consistently because I love him I love him and he is my God and he is my rock and he is my redeemer and he is my shepherd, and he is my savior, and he is my Lord. David is wonderfully transformed because he got desperate. Where are you? Where am I? I wonder anymore if in our culture today, I wonder if we ever see people really get desperate for God. Great promise if we do. Great hope if we do. We're going to give an opportunity to pray. We never want to deprive that. I often encourage people who are seeking to pray this very psalm, Psalm 51. I want to encourage us that what God causes us to yearn for is that which he also will deliver. Praise his name. I'm going to give an invitation, going to give an opportunity for you to come and pray, and then we're going to mention a list of needs. We'll also anoint an individual who's asked to be anointed, but before we do that, there's nothing more important that we can do than responding to what God is saying to each of our hearts. So will you stand with me, please? Father, we do not want to break this moment. We do not want to disrupt the moving of your Spirit. And we don't want to distract or divert attention. We just pray that your Spirit will speak to us today, here in this room. Speak, O oh God, we pray, to our hearts what our need might be, how desperate we need to get for you, and whether or not we have done so and are in good stead with thee. So help us, we pray. Speak to us by your Spirit, powerfully, <clears throat> penetrating, <clears throat> penetratingly, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'd like to encourage anyone who would want to come and gather around our brother to pray. And then I want to also mention that uh, Mary Matthias has asked to be anointed today. Bless her heart. Mary is in the third phase of her treatment for cancer. She's had chemo. She's had radiation. Now she's heading back into round three, which is more chemo. And we want to, an we want to anoint Mary today and pray for her as she moves forward. Chemo in the past has been very rough for her, and we want to pray for her and support her, trust the Lord for her well-being. So Mary, if you will make your way, we have many other requests to, to list and to mention as well. Um, Rachel Green's grandmother, Ruth Hall, passed away uh, yesterday. And, or was it Friday night? And Aaron and Rachel and the family made it really just in time to spend some moments with her before she went to be with the Lord. So we want to pray for them. We're praying for Annette Wood and her family, the family of Don Wood. <clears throat> We're also praying for Helen Mann, uh, Marsha Bear, and we are praying f for, <coughs> excuse me, Pauline Sullivan. Philip Sullivan is going to have brain surgery in the near future, so we're praying for that need. Uh, a Mark Remington, who has cancer, uh, we're, pl we're praying for Tess Akers, and we're also praying for Jaden Spires, little Jaden, who um, physically is just declining, and we want to remember him and uh, pray for this little one. So thank you for gathering to help us pray with Mary. And Mary, this is a privilege to anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, we come to you in a name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. We are taught that when we pray, we are to pray in the name of Jesus. So we are praying in the name of Jesus. We are also encouraged to bring our requests and make them known. And you who cares for us will receive our cares. So we pray today, in all of that urging and with all of that reality, we pray in the name of Jesus for our dear sister in the Lord, Mary. We ask, O oh God, that as she prepares again for another round of chemo, we pray that you would fortify her, her body, strengthen her body. We pray, Lord, that she would go through this treatment better than could be expected or imagined, we pray, Father, that you would provide every means of help along the way that she needs. Lord, if you want to touch her, if you want to heal her and bring this treatment uh, to a point of being unnecessary, we would rejoice. We would rejoice with you and with Mary. We would praise your name. If you choose through treatment, 
to bring healing to her. We're just going to trust Mary into your care. We're going to entrust her to the hands and to the care of our good and gracious God. So we trust you for her well-being. The cares that she has, may she be able, Lord, to put them on you. And the burdens that she's carrying, may we pick up a part of that and make it lighter. We pray that in every way you would wonderfully meet her needs. We believe Mary not only will honor your name and glorify your name, she already has. She already has been. So use her, bless her, fill her, keep her, preserve her, provide for her, Lord, as you know best. We will trust you for her well-being in Jesus' name. And Father, we think of all the other needs that have been mentioned, folks who are grieving, bereavement that has begun. We pray, Lord, that you would be the solace and comfort that you've promised to be. We pray as well, Lord, for little Jaden. Lord, we know that uh, sadly bad things happen to innocent lives. We pray for this little guy. We just lift him to you and ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would minister to his life. We trust you, Lord, that you do, that you have, that you are. And we just ask, Lord, for your grace to abound. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the fact we can call upon you and call upon the body to pray for us. We bring every need to you. We pray for Helen. Lift her to you. Lord, we ask that in every need that we have, whether it's Marcia, whatever the need might be, Lord, that you would fill that void, meet that need, touch that life, glorify your name, and bring good to these lives. We ask all of these things today in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and for his sake, amen, amen, amen. amen. and amen. Well, it's been good to have been in the house of the Lord. God bless you as you are dismissed. Go in his grace and peace, and in his presence you're dismissed.